Uh, if you're familiar with Psalms 119, you know that it's almost dead smack in the middle of the Bible. You know, it's almost dead smack that middle chapter of the entire Bible. Uh, it's believed that King David wrote Psalm 119. Uh, some believe that it may have been Daniel or Ezra, but most believe that it was, uh, that it was David that wrote Psalm 119. And, uh, you know, the older I get, the more I fall in love with the Word of God. You know, the more I just love to read it and study it. And, uh, you know, the more it becomes almost just new to me every time I read it. You know, it's, it's such a joy to just read the Word of God. And that is what Psalms 119 is really all about. If you're familiar with it, you know that it just speaks about God's Word over and over and over again, speaking about how awesome and amazing God's word is, how powerful God's word is, and how it can really touch and change a believer's life. So uh, again, Psalm 119 being almost dead smack in the middle of the, of the Bible there, and I, I find it neat that it is because, you know, I don't know about you, but I have started so many books and stopped halfway through you know, that book, they're never reaching the end of the book that I set out to read. And I just think it, find it neat that as we read the Bible, you know, we can start to, uh, we can start to, uh, uh, you know, uh, dwindle down in our reading or begin to slow down on our reading through the word. Yet right there in the middle, God just gives us an awesome encouragement through Psalm 119 to continue on with the word of God and to keep it on the forefronts of our minds. So, we will be looking at Psalm 119. Let's go ahead and read verse 1. Verse 1 says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that that my ways were directed, then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. Verse seven, I will praise you with uprightness of heart. When I learn your, right, your righteous judgments, I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we just, we lift up this evening to you, Lord, and uh, just want to start off uh, giving you praise, Lord God, and just honor and glory, Father, for uh, just for your greatness, Lord, for your sovereignty, Father, for knowing all things, Lord, for uh, having great thoughts towards us, God. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, as we just get into your word this evening, as we study the book of Psalms, Lord, the chapter of Psalm 119, that we would be blessed by your word, Lord, that we would be reminded about how powerful uh, this book is, Though it may not seem powerful, though it may just seem like, a, like another book, like pages and paper with ink, Lord, we know that it, uh, in it we find life. In it we find hope, Lord. And we just pray, Father, that as we read of David's writings here, that we would be encouraged to continue to read our Bibles uh, in the morning as we wake up, in the evening before we go to bed, Lord. That your scriptures, Lord, would be written on our hearts as your scripture says. We pray, Father, that we would just know your power, Lord, through your scripture, that we would uh, be able to write your scriptures on our hearts, Father, that, uh, Lord, that we would just be able to uh, encourage others through your scriptures, Lord, through the scriptures that you teach us, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would just continue to do a work in this body, Lord, that you would uh, heal uh, my dad as he is sick this evening. We pray, Father, just for a full recovery, that he would get rest. And, and be ready to get back to ministry here at this church, Lord. And we lift up anyone else as well, Father, that is sick, that is not doing well, that is uh, waiting, Father, for that call from the doctor. I know there's a few that are uh, having uh, pretty serious appointments coming up soon. We lift them up to you right now, Lord, and we just pray, God, that uh, you knowing all things, Father, that, that, Lord, your peace would just overflow to them, and that, God, that you would just allow... Uh, that you would just allow them to have that peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord. That they, would, uh, that they would take joy, Father, even in the hard times, Lord. Ultimately, Father, we just pray just for healing, Lord, 
and that you would just continue to uh, just to work in this place, Lord. We just lift up this night in your name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 119. Let's go ahead and read verse 1. Again, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. And you guys know that the children of Israel, the Jewish people, they put such an importance on the word of God. You know, they put such an importance on uh, what they call the Torah or the first five books of the Bible and educating their children in the Torah. They teach their children from the day that they can walk and speak and read and, you know, from the earliest age that they can, they can they uh, uh, educate their children in the laws of the Lord and in Moses' writing uh, in what they consider, uh, you know, the Bible or their Bible, the Torah there. Someone asked the question, at what age does a child's Torah education begin? And somebody answered them saying, let me, let me uh, preface my response with a couple of questions of my own. From what point are parents obligated to feed their children? At what age are parents required to begin providing clothes for their child? And their answer to them, at what age do we start to teach the word of God to our children, was pretty much from the very beginning, from the very beginning. And, and trust me, I know right now with a pregnant wife uh, that, you know, as you start preparing for a child, uh, it's not at the age of three, it's not at the age of two, it's not even at the age of one, and in fact, it's not when the child is born we are preparing for this child even now. Uh, come to my house and you will see piles of clothes and onesies and you know little booties and all these things in, in this baby's room. He has more clothes than I have already. Uh, this baby is already eating and being fed you know, through my wife and that umbilical cord. So uh, from day one, when this baby is in the womb, we start to prepare and this baby starts to uh, be fed. And it's so neat that that's how it is with the word of God. As we come to the Lord, the Lord is preparing us uh, through his scripture. We start to get fed. We start to get prepared through his precepts, through uh, the words of, his, uh, of the Bible here. Uh, the tradition of Jewish education goes back to biblical times and uh, it can be read about in the book of Deuteronomy as uh, the Lord encouraged Moses to encourage the Israelites to raise their children up in the way of the Lord and in the scriptures, always continually reading the word of God. And, uh, and I hope and I pray that you are in love with the word of God because the word of God is the only thing uh, that gives us hope. It's the only thing that gives us life and keeps us grounded and allows us to continue on with the Lord. You know, the word of God has been compared to a sword uh, for a soldier. The word of God has been compared to a uh, loaf of bread, you know, for those that are hungry. And that is what the word of God is to us. It is our defense. It is our offense. It is what we have to battle against this world. You look at uh, uh, the world and what they have as their weapons, they may have uh, a defense. They may have an offense. They may use their jobs as a defense. You know, well, I'm okay because I have this successful career or education that I can fall back on. You know, and they can even use their education to uh, try to uh, get their way, you know, or push their way through. Uh, but for the believer, the weapon is the Word of God. The Word of God is what we use for success and to, uh, to get our way which is ultimately the Lord's way. Deuteronomy 6 through 9 says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets or ornaments between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house 
and on your gates. They took the word of God so seriously. They wrote the word of God everywhere they could. And in fact, you may know that some even took the word of God and put it in that little box and put it on their foreheads and on their hands, literally trying to follow every word that the Lord would uh, speak to them. They took it so serious. And uh, it just reminds me of growing up. And I think my parents still have it. Uh, They have that scripture, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord on a plaque above their door as you walk into the house. And I just think how neat that is. Write it on the doorpost, you know. Write the scripture all over the house. Get it on plaques. Put it up on the walls, you know. My my mom would have scriptures written everywhere. You go into their bathrooms right now, you're, you're sitting there and you'll see scriptures and you're just getting fed through the word of God. No matter what you're doing in that home, you are getting scripture poured into you. Uh, The Jews, by some, are referred to as the people of the book. The people of the book. I thought, wow, how neat that is. The people of the book because the the, uh, love that they have for the word of God. Because everything that they do was directed by the word of God. They were directed by this Torah that Moses uh, had written through the Lord. That the other nations would would even refer to them as the people of the book. Deuteronomy 6 Six through nine says, the word shall be one written in your heart, that it shall be written in your heart. Two, that it should be taught diligently to your children. And three, that it should be discussed when sitting around the house or walking, or it says going to bed or even when you wake up in the morning. All day long, we should be teaching and learning and studying the word of God. There's so much to absorb uh, through this word here. It says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets or ornaments between your eyes. And I don't think that the Lord necessarily meant for us to wear a little box on our foreheads or or on our wrists, on our hands um, uh, to do this repetition or you know this religious action that, that can have no meaning behind it. But what he meant was that everything that we put our hands to, everything that we touch, everything that we do in this life should be directed by the word of God, should be directed by scripture. Should I be uh, doing this? Should I be going there? Uh, Should I be involved in that? It should be directed by the word of God as we look out uh, to what we are putting our hands to, everything that we see. Everything that we allow into our mind, everything that we allow uh, uh, visually to affect us should be directed and filtered through the word of God. After Deuteronomy 6, 9, God tells the children of Israel that the reason for the remembrance of scripture is so that when they go into the promised land, uh, that the other nations there, that the other people from the other lands would not draw them away to the foreign gods and would not cause God's anger to be aroused against them. Just that safeguard that the Lord had set up for the children of Israel through his word. Uh, So many scriptures uh, pertain to the importance of the word of God in Psalm 119. Some that you may have memorized already. uh, Some that you may just know off the top of your head. Psalm 119.11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I shall not sin against you. A very famous scripture that you may know. Psalm 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So many awesome verses that are just pointing uh, to the word of God and its importance. Verse one, let's go ahead and read again. It says, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. And you may see that title there above verse one. It says, meditations on the excellencies of the word of God and just how excellent it is to meditate on that word. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the way of the Lord. What blessing the word of God brings. I've never heard anyone, you know, come up and say, hey, I've just been studying the word of God so much and I've been in the word of God and uh, and I've been seeking after him my whole heart and, you know, my life is just being, is so horrible right now, you know? 
and I'm just cursed and, and so upset. And it's never that way. It's, man, it's such a blessing to study the word of God. The word of God will never overfeed you. It will never overbless you, you know? Uh, sometimes too much of a good thing uh, can be too much, right? Uh, we, we, uh, our lawn in our backyard, uh, we were trying to get it prepared and, and get it looking, you know, real nice and full and, and green and, and all that. And, and uh, though I grew up on, you know, three quarters of an acre, mowing this massive lawn all by myself, you know, uh, no one to help me, none of my brothers, no, I'm just kidding. We would split that thing up into fourths and it was like down to the row, you know, make sure everyone... But um, we had this huge lawn, but now that it comes to my own house, man, I have no idea what I am doing with grass, you know? And my wife got this, uh, this weed and feed that you throw out onto the grass and it's supposed to grow it, you know, and get it all looking real nice and everything. So I said, okay, let me, let me uh, look at this and, and, you know, I'm reading all the direct, okay, you know, this much out and, and this and that and when you're supposed to do it. We throw it all out there and and uh, uh, we come out, you know, a few days later, a week later or so. You know, that whole lawn was just brown and dead, the whole thing. There was about four patches of grass that was left out of that whole lawn. And I think that that was from a previous seed that was there. It was a completely different type of grass. And, of course, reading the back, it says, may not work with all types of grass. You know, that little warning on the label there. Too much of a good thing. That's supposed to be weed and feed for the grass. But thank God that the, that the word of God is not like that. You know, we cannot oversaturate ourselves with his word. Uh, the more we read it, the more we dive into it and get into it, the more blessed we will be. It says, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord, who seek him, uh, or blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him, with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways are, were directed to keep your statutes. Uh, then I would not be ashamed when I look into all of your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart. When I learn your righteous judgments, I will keep your statutes. Uh, oh, do not forsake me utterly. The book of Proverbs contains many verses about education and the importance of education. And Proverbs 3, 1 through 2 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, uh, but let your mind retain my commandments, for they will bestow on you length of days, years of life, and well-being. Well-being, the blessing that comes from learning the word of God. According to uh, a Jewish rabbi, uh, Judah Tama, uh, at five years of age, uh, when that is reached for a Jewish boy, uh, it's ready to start studying uh, the Bible. At age 10, they are ready to start studying the Mishnah, uh, which is Jewish law and, and, uh, and a collection of Jewish uh, um, uh, laws and, and scripture. At 13, for fulfilling the, the mitzvah at 15 for studying the tumult. So they have a specific plan that is set up, that is in order uh, for the Jewish child to study the word of God, seeing the importance of it. One rabbi said that even if the rebuilding of the temple take place in Jerusalem, classes are not to be interrupted. Wow. How important that building of the temple for them would be in Jerusalem. And yet the teacher would still not dismiss class for those children, still desiring to teach them the word of God. Verses 1 through 8, here in Psalm 119, we see uh, the command to keep his precepts uh, diligently, he says. And the first thing to keeping God's precepts is to knowing God's precepts. You know, how many times do we just... You know, say, I have no idea what the Lord has for me right now. Or I have no idea what the direction is or where I should be in ministry or where I should go. And, and yet we're not putting the time and the effort into reading God's word and his instructions for our lives. It is that diligent, uh, uh, that diligent uh, um, uh, action that we need in keeping his precepts that, are, that is brought forth by the reading 
of, of the word. Um, it says in verse three that they also do no iniquity. I, I, I really enjoy that scripture. They also do no iniquity. I don't know about you, but I haven't gotten to that point yet where I'm doing no iniquity, you know, where I'm above sin or, or sin has, has uh, uh, I've had it completely under control. But yet the verse above it in verse two, it says, who seek him with the whole heart. How hard it is to sin. How hard it is to get angry how hard it is to disobey the Lord when we're seeking after the Lord with our whole heart. When we're reading and studying the word of God. How hard it is, you know, to, uh, to disobey the Lord. But yet how easy it is on the flip side to uh, disobey the Lord or to get angry, you know, as we're driving or with a spouse or at a job when we're not in our words daily. It's that man that is seeking after God with his whole heart. Uh, that is kept from sin, that is kept from iniquity. Verse five says, oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all of your commands. I don't know about you, but I hate being ashamed. I hate walking into a room and just knowing that, you know, here we go. It was my fault. I did something wrong. I got to pay the, the price for this thing right now, you know. But yet the psalmist here says that when I look into your commandments, that I will not be ashamed. When I keep your statutes, that I will not be ashamed. That burden is taking off, taken off of the shoulders. You know, there's no shame whatsoever because we're fully uh, following the word of God. We're fully following the commandments that the Lord has set before us. How awesome that would be to stand before the Lord unashamed, unashamed, you know, just peacefully, knowing, uh, knowing that we are just guiltless. And of course, uh, that it only takes place through the blood of Christ. Verse nine says, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart, I have sought you. Oh, uh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the, mount, in the way of your testimonies as much as in the all riches, I will meditate on your precepts. Verse 16, and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. D.L. Moody said either the Bible will keep you from sin or your sin will keep you from the Bible. Typically, it is one or the other there. And verse nine says, how can a young man cleanse his way. How do we cleanse our way? The answer is by hearing and doing the word of God, by taking heed according to your word. The question is asked, how do you not wander far from good or far from righteousness? And the answer is by seeking after the Lord. How do you not sin against the Lord? And the answer is given by memorizing and by knowing the word of God. Jesus said that you have uh, no power because you do not know the word of God. Uh, the first stanza here in, in Psalms 119, you know it's in a, uh, it is a poem here, an acrostic poem, and it is written in a way that, uh, as an acrostic poem is, that uh, each letter of the alphabet would spell out uh, the verse there in the song or in the praise or in the poem. And Psalm 119 is the only uh, poem here in the book of Psalms that has more than one verse for each Hebrew letter. It actually has eight verses for each Hebrew letter. And if you look at your, at your chapter there, uh, you see the Aleph, which is the A there, or the first letter uh, of the Hebrew alphabet there at the uh, Psalm 119 in the beginning. And then you have Beth there at the top of uh, verse nine and so on and so forth. And eight verses here um, uh, of praise and honor to the Lord. In the first stanza, it encourages us to keep God's commandments, to keep the commandments that the Lord sets out before us, that we wouldn't be ashamed. And the second stanza, it gives us the hope 
that even when, even if, not really a matter of if, but when uh, we mess up, when we fall into sin, when we disobey the Lord, that we still have that hope of being cleansed or being clean. Verses one through eight, a command to be blessed by the word of God, to heed the word of God, to follow the word of God. But I love verse nine because it says, hey, that young man who is dirty, that young man that has not kept the word of God, you still have hope to be cleansed. You still have hope for that clean way. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word, by just falling back on what we know, by falling back on the word of God. Don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. The word of God allows us to never lose hope. It allows us uh, to continue to have that faith in the Lord. That's what faith is, right? The evidence of things hoped for. The evidence of things hoped for is that faith. We need to always have faith or hope in the Lord. It's so easy to lose hope when we're not reading our words, when we're not reading the word. It's so easy uh, to lose hope when we look at this world and we see the circumstances that surround us and yet we pick up our Bibles and we open it up and we get into the word of God and that hope just comes flowing back. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that he has for us through that faith. The Bible has every answer for every situation. Don't you love that? No matter what situation you're going through in life, you know, I don't care what it is, the Bible has the answer for it. Whatever it is, whether it be marital problems, whether it be a problem at work with the, with the job, with the boss, uh, whether it be where to move to, you know, whatever that problem or issue is, no matter how small, no matter how large, the Bible has an answer for it. That is what is so neat about the scriptures. That's what's so powerful uh, about the word of God. Let's read verse 17. It says, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. You rebuke the proud, the cursed who stray from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your statutes, your testimonies also uh, are my delight and my counselors. Your testimonies are my delight and my counselors. The psalmist makes three requests here in verse 17 through 24. Uh, the first request that he makes is, Lord, be gracious to me. That is the request there in verse 17. Deal bountifully with me. Bless me, Lord God. Be gracious to me. Uh, the second request uh, that he makes is that he would have wisdom or insight uh, to be able to see clearly. He says there in verse 18, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things. Uh, he asks to have sight, to have wisdom. Uh, the third thing that the psalmist requests is that the Lord would reveal specific commandments or desires that the Lord uh, would have for the psalmist. He says, do not hide your commandments from me. And after we learn the word of God, as we saw in the first stanza, to walk in the law of the Lord, uh, after the Lord cleanses us, uh, as we saw in the second stanza there, verses 9 through 16, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? Uh, then, and only then, it allows us and puts us in a position to make a request now to the Lord. And then, can we, uh, can we ask to be blessed and to have grace from the Lord? But notice the reason behind the request from the psalmist here. Notice the reason why he asked for grace. He asked for grace, why? He says that I may keep your word, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your 
were the reason behind the request. Number two, why does he ask for wisdom or insight or sight? He asks for wisdom. He says that I may see your wondrous things from your law. So I can see how awesome you are, God. So I can see how marvelous you are. The reason behind the request. Number three, why does he ask for direction? He asks for direction. He says, because I am a stranger in the earth. In verse 19 there, I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. He says, I am lost without you, Lord. This world is not my home. I'm just a stranger here. I'm a sojourner. And he says, give me direction, Lord. Uh, allow me uh, to, ha- to know your commandments. All of the uh, requests that we have to the Lord, everything that we bring before God, uh, every prayer request that we have should have a righteous or a biblical reason behind it. You know, uh, it shouldn't be for our own good. It shouldn't be for our own, you know, uh, selfish, selfish desires. Uh, it should be for, uh, for a, re- a righteous uh, desire that the Lord would have for us, those requests, you know, whatever it be. And we can say, well, you know, uh, you know, we're asking for a car, or we're asking for a house, but you know, why are we asking for those things? You know, are we asking for those things simply, uh, uh, you know, to have the, the brand new, you know, the newest 2015 model, you know, are we asking for that so that we can keep up with the neighbor next door or have the bigger, you know, house in the family? Or are we asking for those things for the right reason? You know, so I can get my family around. Lord, get me a car that just runs. Get me a car that won't break down on me, Lord, so that I can be faithful to provide for my family, to put a roof over their head. You know, we can ask for something, and it, can, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will have a righteous uh, uh, reason behind it, uh, but it may uh, have that reason. So whatever we're asking, make sure that it is that biblical uh, purpose or reason behind that request. He says there, uh, he says there in verse 20, he says, my soul breaks with longing for your judgment at all times. My soul breaks for longing of your judgment. What man says that his soul is longing for judgment? You know, what person uh, desires and wants judgment to happen? Well, the man that seeks for judgment is the man that has nothing to fear the man that has nothing to worry about. And this is what David is saying. This is what the psalmist is saying. I long for your judgment, Lord. I long for you to finally just come and, and just allow everything to be done and over. I, lo- I, I, I desire, I long for, uh, for wickedness to be judged. I allow for it, for wickedness, for evilness uh, to come to an end. But the man that longs after judgment is the man himself that knows that he has nothing to worry about when that judgment comes. And that's where we should be with the Lord, uh, knowing, having that assurance of our salvation, knowing uh, that there is no penalty that needs to be paid other than what already has on the cross. And that is just the peace that the word of God brings to us. Verse 25 says, My soul clings to the dust, Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. So, I, uh, so shall I meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strength, strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. For you shall enlarge my heart. His word brings life. The word of God brings life. John 1, 4 says, Uh, declares that in him or in the word is life. He is the word of life, John 1, 4. John 5, 24 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. 
The word of God brings life. We try to hold on to this life so much, right? The psalmist here says there in verse 25, he says, my soul clings to the dust. It holds on to the dust. No matter what I do, that dust will not get off of me. I, I am going back to the ground. My body will eventually uh, be turned back to dust no matter what I do, right? And Jesus said in, in Mark 8 that any man that tries to save his life will lose it. Any man that tries to save his life will lose it. How do we try to save our life? You know, we try to save our lives uh, in many different ways, ways that maybe we don't necessarily see as trying to save our life, but we can do it through money, the desire for money, the love for money, the love for wealth. We can desire to save our lives through a job, through uh, success uh, in a career. We can desire to save our, jo- uh, save our lives through a spouse and thinking that if I just have that spouse or that woman or that man, my life will be complete Everything will be okay. These are means that we typically do in life, trying to save, trying to preserve, trying to create a successful life uh, outside of the Lord through entertainment, with fame, with glory. Uh, The psalmist here says that his soul uh, is but dirt, that it's pinned to the ground and that the only thing that can revive it is the word of God, that the only thing that can bring life is the word there in verse 25, revive me according to your word. And that's where we need to look to for life. Anyone who, 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 say, who desires to save his life will lose it. But anyone who loses it for my sake, Jesus said, will find it, will, uh, will save it. So we need to look to Jesus to save our lives and to his scripture. And saving our lives just means to preserve, you know, to find that peace and hope, that, uh, that uh, to allow uh, eternity for, for our life. We're not gonna find it here in this world. Verse 33 says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it, to the end. Give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Verse 35, make me walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in them. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. No wonder David was called a man after God's own heart. He delighted in the commandments of God. Uh, He he delighted in the word of God. He took, uh, it brought him joy you know, he, uh, he despised uh, the commandments of the world. He didn't despise the commandments of, uh, of the Lord and what the Lord had for him. You know, if God's word is not a delight for you, if his commandments aren't a delight for you, if you don't find joy uh, in the boundaries that he has set up for us as believers, I would say go back and look at the reason that he has set up those boundaries. Go back and look at the purpose for his word, you know, uh, that safety net that he has set up. And really, it's just to bless us. It's just for our own good. And in that, I think, is where David finds his joy and that he can say uh, that he delights in the commandments from the Lord. It is a delight. You know, it's not always a delight to necessarily do the commandments that God has for us. It's not necessarily always a delight to, you know, if the Lord tells us to do something that's extremely uncomfortable, you know, it might not be delightful as we are doing it. But the reason behind uh, uh, that action or that command, it always is for good and it always brings joy. And David found that. And because of that, he was called a man after God's own heart. Find joy. Delight in the word of God. Take delight in his commandments and what he has for us. Verse 41 says, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word and take not 
the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your uh, ordinances. So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I will seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed, and I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up Uh, to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. The word of God gives us certain liberties. There in verse 45, I will walk at liberty. It gives us freedom. It gives us freedom from sin. It gives us freedom from that bondage uh, uh, from alcohol, from that bondage of anger, that so easily ensnares you know, the world and so easily traps us. The word of God allows us that liberty uh, uh, in our lives and we should take joy in that. Proverbs 2, 6 is, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He gives us an answer for those that have a question, the psalmist says. It says that you will have an answer for those who reproach you and a testimony for kings. How neat that is. Those that question you, those that question your faith, those that question why you do the things you do as a believer, why you are so committed to this God, the word of God will give you an answer to those people. Uh, Without the word of God, there is no answer. It says that it will give you a testimony for kings. It'll give you you a testimony for those uh, uh, that are in a high position, those that are in high regard. It will allow you to be a witness to them, to be a testimony to them in a way that you never thought uh, possible. Spurgeon said, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone that isn't. A Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to to somebody who isn't. The more your Bible is just uh, broken and beat up, the more your life uh, will be put together. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, fall in love uh, with your Bible. Fall in love with the Word. Study it. Desire to learn it. Desire to memorize it. Uh, John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. It did not comprehend it, or it does not overtake it. This world cannot overtake the light that shines from the Lord. It says that the word is the light of men. It is that beacon on a dark night that we set our eyes upon that gives us a clear path to. Fall in love with your word. Jesus, it says here, is the word of God. It says that all things were made through him. Nothing was made without him. I find it interesting that you can try to explain this world and what is made without God that as an uh, evolutionist can try to explain life, can try to explain uh, uh, matter without a creator. And uh, even though, uh, uh, if they were even able to prove their point, to prove that matter could come into existence without a creator, how do you explain the soul? How do you explain your spirit? How do you explain uh, that thing that lives inside of us that allows us to see and speak and feel that leaves the body when the body dies, you know? Okay, ex- explain, you know, your evolution and your monkeys and all that. Have fun with it. But how do you explain a soul? It is impossible that anything was made uh, without the Lord. In him, all things were made and nothing was made without him. 